Welcome. We're live with Capital Technology University Q&A on doctoral programs. I'm President Brad Sims. Today we have the Dean of Doctoral Programs, Ian McAndrew. We're broadcasting live from his location in London. Uh, we hope to be able to answer a Q&A here for anybody who wants to ask questions about our online doctoral programs. We do have an upcoming um, live open house hosted by Dr. McAndrew on Sunday. He'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. McAndrew, kind of highlight the online doctoral programs and the upcoming open house. Please send in your questions in the QA and we'll get to those shortly. Thank you very much, President Sims. Well, it's a delight to be here today. And just to sort of clarify and make sure you understood what was introduced, well, my name is Ian McAndrew. I'm the Dean of Doctoral Programs at Capital Technology University, just north of Washington, D.C. And that's correct. I'm coming to you from London. Indeed, this is where I live. Now, that may seem incongruous, first of all. But remember, you know, we're living in an online world now and we have an international doctoral degree. We literally have students from all over the world that are studying with us. And my position sort of in London is a nice central location for dealing with people from the Far East, from Africa, Europe, and all over America. And we're proud of that. And we've expanded and we have a great selection of people, literally, who are studying from various parts of the four corners of the globe with us. And that's because we offer degrees which are both flexible and needed. And on Sunday, we have a virtual open house that we have every month. And it's at three o'clock in the afternoon on Eastern time. Now, that isn't always a good time or possible for everyone else around the world. So we have these sort of preamble ones that we have in now, not as a full open house, but as a way to introduce and start answering questions or introduce ourselves to you. I would encourage you to go to our website and you can register for the open house. And if it is of a time which is not practical for you, because maybe it's the middle of the night, if you've registered, the recording will be sent to you and then you can sort of review it. And if you've got any specific or general questions, contact myself and we'll get answers to you. Now, the open house, we go through a lot of information. We cover the things and the detail that a lot of students want to know. And the majority of students have about sort of 80 to 90 percent identical questions. But some of you have individual and specific ones. And of course, we are here, that's both on the academic side, myself, and if it's on the application or the admissions side, we have the admissions department supportive. Now, what we do at Capital, we are what you will classify in most parts of the world, a STEM university. We do primarily STEM types of subjects. Historically, so the computing, electronics, communication was our history. But we do a lot of cyber, we do artificial intelligence, and we do quantum. And this type of thing is important because these are the skills and these are the jobs that people need. I came to Capital Technology University in 2018, and I've been the dean ever since. And I was charged by the president with make sure to make sure that we maintain a very high standard of doctoral degree for our accreditation, also to introduce new degrees which industry needs and as well as with all presidents you know student numbers and retention and i've spent a lot of time working on that and we've become very successful in what we're doing and about or possibly over half of our students that are currently enrolled are probably there because of a recommendation from a, a graduate that suggested that they should consider capital to come along we offer some unique ways which other universities don't. We have the classic American way where you will do about a three years of the first two years where you're doing classes in the evening and you'll be doing introduction to different subjects, methodologies, data mining and different things like that. And you have a yearly resident. And then the final year is roughly you work with a committee to develop and produce then defend a dissertation. The vast majority of American doctoral degrees are in that format. However, we appreciate this is rather difficult and cumbersome for some of the people that need the degrees that we are teaching. And I'll give you an example. 
Many of our people work in some of the three-digit agencies or even for the military, or they work in, they work various positions in legal or senior management, which involves travel and flexibility in their time. And to commit to one night a week for three years is something which is very, very difficult. We have what we call your European style of model. You know, it's very much akin to what you see in many parts of the world and particularly identical to what we have in the United Kingdom. And these are what we call mental research models. Now, these ones are really you start and you undertake a very large piece of research. You don't necessarily have to have an idea what you're going to research before you come along. You may have a general idea. And we have some very interesting students. We had a student that came along and they wanted to look, and this was as purely theoretical as I've dealt with in my career. They wanted to look at the harmonics of prime numbers between one and 200,000. And they were looking for patterns and post-quantum encryption. Very, very specific and built upon previous work that they had. But then we have the other end of the spectrum where people turn up and look, I want to do something in artificial intelligence. I don't know what. I don't know what needs to be done. Help me. And we can support both extremes and everything in between. And what you would do at the beginning of your studies, we will assign a chair to your research. Now, that chair will be a subject matter expert in something identical or very close to the area that you're researching. And for the first semester, they will help you develop a robust research plan. And this is very critical. Now, I've, I've been chairing research students since 1991. And my 163rd doctoral student completed last month. That doesn't make me the best chair in the world. But what it does give me is an insight in terms of the range of research and doctoral degrees that you get. It means that when we review your proposal and there is a robust proposal to go through, we check it for a couple of classic mistakes. One, students often try to do more research than is necessary. That is a problem because you never finish. There's the risk that people might plan something which is not deep enough and far reaching enough to warrant a doctoral degree. So we go through a quality check to make sure that you are planning something which is of the right standard and the right amount of work for a doctoral degree. And we have external advisors to make sure that this is maintained in terms of a consistency. Then we know the real area of your research. We add another committee member who will be complementing your chair and they will have research experience, PhD supervision experience, they will have subject matter expertise, they will have research publication expertise. So you have a nice dedicated small team. Then they will support you going through the literature, reviewing a methodology, justifying a methodology, collecting the data, presenting it and then defending it all the way through. Now at the very end of the process, we also have an independent person nothing to do with your research, possibly nothing to do with the university, it depends, who will be there at the defence and that maintains a standard not only between each year but amongst all the degrees that we have to ensure a standard level is maintained. And we're very proud of how we do this. And a lot of our research is downloaded by many of the big R1 and research universities all over the world. And this is how we maintain and we work to support students. We have more checks and balances than the vast majority of PhDs that you may apply for. But we have more internal checks periodically to ensure people are progressing. And if people are progressing well and they have time and the funds, they can double up on classes and finish earlier. The average student that starts a doctoral degree finishes about three to three and a half years after starting. That is faster than most of our competition. And that's not because it's easier. We have more checks. It's because we have a system that works. This is what I've set up and this is what I've run. But it's also possible to do the research and instead of writing it up as a classic dissertation, to divide the work. And what you can do then is do it by three publication route. And you write a small document called an exegesis which bridges them together. 
and that's where you get your final document to defend. You meet with your committee at times to suit yourselves. And there's only three of you, your chair, your committee and yourself. If you go to other universities, they often flood the committee and you may have six people on there. And their role is to make sure that they're on a tenure track to get research experience and supervising you with no real commitment to you, but just a checkbox exercise. That doesn't happen with us. And when you, and if I may share a joke here, and I often use this joke, so if you've seen any of my presentations and I crack it again, bear with me. You ask six professors for an opinion and you get nine answers. During your research and a doctoral degree, there are three very key stages where you submit major pieces of work and they are reviewed. What classically happens in many universities, six people on a team, each person needs at least two weeks to read it, and it goes on a round robin exercise, and you end up waiting 12 to 14 weeks to get any feedback. That's over three months. But three times, that's nine, 10, 11 months, nearly a year, when you're supposed to be doing your research and you're just waiting for feedback. With a small dedicated team that are working closely with you, that's sort of removed because they're dealing with you each week. They know you on a very personal basis. They know exactly what you're doing. And it doesn't take all this time. And that is a big, big situation that we offer that supports students. Now, you remember I said when you come along in the first semester to develop a plan. And I always say this, and I do believe it, it's important not to rush at the start of a doctoral degree. It's very important to plan. And planning and having that verified is a substantial key to the success of students. Now, sometimes chairs leave. And if you've spoken to some people that have started and they never finished a doctoral degree elsewhere, well, one, tell them to come to us and you can transfer the credits. But one of the things they're most likely to say is well, everything seemed to be going all right. And then my chair left. And my new chair said, well, what you've been doing isn't good enough. You've got to go back to square one. And I want to bring someone else on the committee. Well, we have this verification process of your research plan. And if your chair did leave, and it doesn't happen often at our university, if they did leave, any new appointed chair will be picking up this pre-approved research plan and not telling you, I don't like this, start again. This helps not only with retention, but our completion rate. Because getting a plan that you know that you're doing is critical. We've implemented a lot of best practices from all over the world of how doctoral degrees work, how we support them and get them through. But we also have an admissions process, which is quite sort of direct to support you. You know, we're looking at things and yes, we ask for three to five years experience. But if it's in quantum, very few people have five years experience. What we're looking for is experience in the associated area or the preamble area that allow you to do this research. We don't somewhat want someone with a degree in history, then an MBA in management, applying to do a PhD in quantum because we know that they won't have the skill set to do it. And we're very, very thorough about how we do this. And myself or the admissions department, we try to speak to everyone on a one-to-one -one basis where possible to explain, to make sure things are clear. And whether it's the classic American style of doing it or the UK European style of doing it, that we have a system that's going to support you. And that's very, very critical. Those areas are there. And if you're here today and you're thinking about a doctoral degree and you're going to question us, and which is good, and you're going to make sure and you're going to compare and apply to other universities. Ask the questions. What's the average completion rate? How often do chairs replaced? How many people are on the committee? What are the milestones? How many people are taking six years to complete? These are the questions that you should be asking. Now, if I scare you away, that's also good because it means you don't come to us. And after one or two semesters think this isn't the right fit for me. I'm going elsewhere because then no one's satisfied. Our completion rate goes down, your satisfaction of our university goes down. No one benefits by just getting the student in. We have no idea whether it's the right actual degree for them and the right way of their study. And by doing things on a big research program and focusing on the research, if you do one of those models, 
We try to find your interest and your skill set and your work experience to make a research question out of that. The more that we can do that, the less background reading that you will need to do. Because there is a substantial amount of background reading necessary in research. You have to show you're aware of the knowledge. Now, we have the history and the expertise to do this. We have people who chair you, who have extensive experience of chairing students for years, subject matter experts. And if you know very little about the university, if you look on a map where we are, and then you look very closely within a 20 mile radius of where our university is, and you will see some of the great and the good Department of Defense, Justice, and all the agencies that are the backbone of America. Many of our students have studied there, Many of our chairs are from there, and this is important. And if you look at the moment, you can see someone called Dr. Mary Aiken has come along. And we're very fortunate with her. She's a wonderful example. She is the chair, she's the department chair of cyber psychology. And in my opinion, and this isn't an over-exaggeration, she is probably the world leader in these areas. She is extensive knowledge in forensic cyber psychology, and perhaps and the only person I've ever met with a PhD in this area that's leading it. We have other people who are Fulbright scholars. We have other people that have experience in the most enormous profound areas. And some of our students own space companies, work at senior positions in NASA. And this professionalism is important. You know, we are increasing our student numbers, but these are in stage of steps that we can support them. And you look at here, you know, Dr. Mary Aiken, you've only got to Google her and you can see truly, you know, she has been asked to deliver speeches all over the world in some of the most keynote positions. We have Dr. Sims here, who is the president of the university, one of the most innovative educators you'll ever come across. And we offer this sort of foundation that we build upon to support you. Now, just very briefly, Professor Mary, if I may ask you just to introduce yourself very quickly, while we see if there's any more questions that need to be asked, you are know, asked, or if we can answer. Sure. Um, I'm Mary uh, Aiken. I'm a cyber behavioral scientist. I'm a professor of cyber psychology at CapTech and chair of the department. As you say, we have a Masters of Science uh, in Cyber Psychology, or sorry, an MRes in Cyber Psychology, Masters of Research in Cyber Psychology. We offer a PhD in Cyber Psychology. We have launched or are launching a Masters by Research in Forensic Cyber Psychology, and also, I believe shortly, our PhD in Forensic Cyber Psychology is going to come online. So effectively, cyber psychology is um, an advanced, uh, we used to call it emerging, but it's now an established discipline. It's the study of the impact of technology on human behavior. And effectively, it's, it's, it's an, an incredible um, science in terms of illuminating that intersection between humans and technology. I've been involved in the area of uh, cyber psychology for over two decades now, and I'm delighted to see that its importance is getting stronger and stronger at all levels. In fact, I'm going to drop in a link into the uh, chat here for everybody to see, where recently IARPA, which is the um, a division of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and specifically IARPA, is Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity. And IARPA did a call for proposals regarding, or an RFI, or a, a request for information at this stage, the call for proposals will follow, um, on the topic of cognitive effects in cyber operations. And they specifically acknowledge that cyber psychology is an emerging scientific field that integrates human behavior and decision making in the cyber domain. And really, IARPA is seeing how could cyber psychology as a discipline um, be useful in terms of characterizing cognitive effects in cyber operations 
either in attack or defense uh, scenarios. So I'll, I'll, I'll drop a link here, actually, I'll do it now. So while we're on the call, people can see it. Um, and you know, this is a tremendous step forward in terms of IARPA recognizing the importance of cyber psychology and a very good indicator for anybody who's watching this broadcast of the importance of obtaining a higher degree in cyber psychology or uh, our new degrees in forensic cyber psychology. So what is forensic cyber psychology? Well, it focuses on human factors behind uh, cyber attacks and cyber crime. So we study offender and perpetrator profiling. So that's cyber behavioral profiling. We look at what motivates uh, perpetrators or criminals to act in the way they do from sophisticated threat actors to uh, nation state or nation sponsored or condoned threat actors. And we also look at gaining insights in terms of understanding entry or pathways into cyber criminality or cyber uh, delinquency. We look at risk taking harmful behavior and harmful behaviors online. And also we consider online victimology. And out of that, we look at developing methodologies for online investigative procedures that might help to mitigate a cyber criminal or cyber threat behavior. In fact, at the moment, I am one of the leads on a pan-European uh, research project, which is investigating human and technical drivers of cyber crime. So we're all familiar with the technical drivers in terms of the exploits that are available, particularly on dark web forums uh, for threat actors, be it criminal or other. And effectively, this project was looking at human drivers. What, what were the human factors associated with these behaviors? So again, I'll drop a link in uh, to the chat here and you can see some of our research projects, uh, our research out project outputs um, and our journals and our, our deliverables in this regard. So I'm maybe biased, but this is a fascinating area of research. And I would recommend that anybody should consider um, doing a hybrid, higher degree in cyber psychology or in forensic cyber psychology because your knowledge can be applied across a wide range of endeavor from education through to industry, through to defense activity, through to intelligence agencies, through to law enforcement, through to justice, and all the way through uh, some aspects of cyber psychology deal with healthcare and health tech aspects. You know, I've published in the area of cyberchondria, which is the study of um, anxiety induced uh, through uh, escalation during medical related search online. What does that mean? You have a headache, you search and you start reviewing content about brain tumor. And um, so that escalation and the anxiety that comes with it. So you may be perfectly well, but end up with the nasty case of health anxiety as a result of escalation during search. And it also taps into the areas of wearable technologies. And everybody, as we rush in health tech towards wearable uh, technologies, the gap in the knowledge may be that a percentage of the population are subject to hypochondria. When that interfaces with tech, then you move into an area of cyberchondria. And one of the uh, symptoms of cyberchondria is excessive focus with symptoms. Symptomatology. What does that mean? Overly obsessing about your blood pressure, overly obsessing about your heartbeat, overly thinking about uh, the workings of your in, you know, internal uh, organs to the point of having anxiety. So what that means in a health tech scenario, that wearable tech is not for everybody. And we should be thinking about measures to lever pre, to measure predisposition to health anxiety before strapping wearable tech on general population. So that's just some of the um, areas that I work in. I work frontline uh, with Europol as an academic advisor. I also work uh, frontline with Interpol uh, in terms of academic advice. I'm doing a lot of interesting research in terms of how we can stage intervention and mitigate uh, cyber criminal and cyber threat behavior. But check out the IARPA piece. It's just fascinating. Thank you very much, Dr. Murray. If I can also sort of, I was in, very fortunate re recently to be in a meeting with Dr. Marius and we were working with a student and um, we were dealing with the student who's going for a PhD, possibly by a publication. Now, one of the other person, 
that was working who was in this area was someone who had um, recently been working as a top cyber security person at the white house and then there's dr mary there and they're advising the student about doing their research paper and different things like this you know how many places in the world can you sit down and have a meeting with people of that standing in their sector that are guiding you through it and i know and i have to thank dr mary here that our people who are doing the cyber psychology route and if they're publishing papers she offers to go down and review on a one-to-one -one basis with them their research paper and different things and support them for publishing and different things like this again that's a unique thing that we offer that very few people get we had a student in a different subject from dr mary's who had a phd from a for-profit university and they couldn't get a job on a tenure track position anywhere they came to us and did a phd and they now are on a tenure track position at chapel hill university and that tells you something about how people do it and what they're doing it for and the advantages we cannot guarantee success after completion but what we can say is that many of our completed graduates are successful and this is a big part of what they're doing and when you think about it some of you here may be thinking about you know well i finished my career and i want to go into academia at the next stage of life if you do a research degree with us and you do it by publication route well then you've got your doctoral degree but you've got all that experience about publishing which is invaluable and a lot of people do their research and then they publish well that can give you a sort of an advantage if you're applying for situations and those are the things which are unique and different for, with us from many american universities now some of you then you know i'm in london dr mary's in dublin you know uh, dr sims is in washington dc look at us now when we say we're international that's true we literally are international and for some of you that may have your first degree or even a master's degree from germany from australia wherever you are in the world if you come to us then you have a portfolio on your academic history which shows an international flavor. There's not many places where you can do an online doctoral degree at an American accredited university, which is a big frog in a small pond. We only do STEM. We don't do law. We don't do psychology in the classic sense or anything else like that. You go to any university that does law, that does some of the humanities and those types of things, and the lecture rooms are full. Now, at a doctoral level, it's a one-to-one -one when you're dealing with your research dissertation. We only do degrees in areas that we have the strength and we specialise in. And that's very important. And as we come into the end of our half an hour, I always say it's always a pleasure to have any platform with Dr. Mary because um, of her international reputation in that particular way. But maybe we could hand back now to President Sims if you would like to wrap up this session. Well, I'd like to thank both. Dr. Aiken and Dr. McAndrew for being on the uh, short presentation here today on our doctoral programs. We do have a live open house coming up on February 26 at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time that you can register for via the website. Dr. McAndrew will be leading through that with more details on the programs and other things since like our library resources, which are continually growing and um, cost associated with it as well. It's a, it's a jam-packed one-hour open house. But as you can hear from both of our uh, industry experts here, I mean, Capital Technology University, we are founded based around degree programs that are right now needed in industry at the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral level. Of course, our undergraduate programs, most of those are on campus here in at, in uh, the states near Washington, D.C., we're about 15 miles north of it. You're happy to visit if you like. The online master's and online doc programs, our students complete them, and they uh, many times show up for our graduation on campus, which is a, a great uh, event. This uh, graduation coming up this spring, we already have 1,300 people who are reserved a spot. It's outside under a huge tent. We, we really enjoy that day. But... Uh, industry and us work closely together, as you can hear from both of our experts here. Um, we cover everything from computer science to artificial intelligence, cyber psychology, um, construction, aviation, 
risk management, um, mechatronics, robotics, unmanned systems, and space. So we cover all the high need industry jobs. And we see in the doctoral programs that we're talking today are most international students. Dr. McAndrew has students from Singapore to uh, Germany and everywhere in between. Um, and we hope that you come and, and join us for that. It is a, a great way that we've designed these programs at the uh, PhD and master's level so that you can work full time while still being mentored by an individual expert to get through the program. Um, our, our online master's programs, classes are designed in eight week online asynchronous formats. PhD is much more of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, deliverable type of event. Uh, we, we certainly uh, enjoy working with people from industry. They can use their knowledge that they are working in towards their dissertations or theses to complete and, and it's a great way for them to apply it right away, what knowledge base they're learning throughout the process. So once again, I want to thank everybody for coming here today, our two experts, Dr. Aiken, Dr. Andrew, and those of you who have joined us online. Um, I do not see any other uh, comments from folks to answer. So if I could just wrap yes. up maybe just by saying that, you know, the thing about cyber psychology and forensic cyber psychology is this is a new scientific frontier. And by engaging in research in this area, you're going to help to shape a future discipline. My work in cyber psychology over the last two decades has taken me everywhere from NATO to the EU, to the UK government, to the United Nations, to US Army Cyber Command, up to the White House. In fact, I just presented at the White House uh, just in December. So cutting edge disciplines really add value, invariable, very, very enjoyable to study. Thank you, Dr. Aiken. Dr. McAndrew, any final word? Come along to the open house on Sunday if you're available. If not, drop me an email and I'll contact you directly. And thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody.